be able to go ahead and start, I think. Um, Tim, is there anybody in the room? Anyone from the public? Did you hear from the other Melissa? Uh, She's both, in Melissa's, the both Melissa's are here. Uh, okay. Melissa Sarples. Yeah, we're, everybody's here. Megan's here. We're all accounted for. Um, okay. Well, I can't tell if there's anyone there, so I'm just going to trust that there isn't anyone there. But um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening and welcome to the May 13th, 2021 meeting of the New Market Conservation Commission. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Sue, do I call the roll? Patrick Reynolds. Present. Ellen Snyder. Here. Chris Blackstone. Here. Melissa Brogel. Here. David Bell. Here. Melissa Sharples. Here. Megan Brabeck. Present. And of course, Jenny's here. <laughs> okay. And Jeff. Well, Present since... and alone. <laughs> Present and alone. That's right. We, we don't say that as we don't tend to say that, but you're, you're right to say that we should probably. Um, so tonight we do have a guest speaker. Um, and uh, our guest speaker tonight is Jenny Humphreys, who is with Mr. Fox composting. She's been with them for over two years, and she is the operations manager. So that means she's managing all the behind scene aspects of the composting company. And she did want to add that uh, Mr. Fox has been around over 10 years and they service the New Hampshire seacoast and parts of Southern Maine. They offer curbside residential service and commercial service for businesses. And um, so she's here to talk to us about composting tonight and give us more information. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> we don't, I don't get to do many uh, events anymore because of COVID, obviously. <laughs> so this is kind of fun. Um, so yeah, so as Patrick said, um, I've been with Mr. Fox for a little over two years. Um, and I do all of the kind of behind the scenes work. Um, do any of you compost with Mr. Fox right now? You can raise your hand, I guess. No? No? Yeah. Oh, all right. One. David. David. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, I guess a, a little bit, um, about the programs itself. So we do offer a residential curbside program, um, which basically, constitutes where we a uh, customer will sign up and they weekly or bi-weekly service depending on what location they're in and then we give them a compost bin with a compostable liner and once you get that you can start uh, putting all of your organic waste in that bin and then on a designated day we will drive by and we'll pick up the bin curbside dump the context contents into our trucks and then they leave you a fresh compostable liner to start again for the next week or two weeks of your composting and then our trucks haul all of that organic waste back to our facility now our facility is actually based in york um, maine and we operate on a windrow system um, so what that actually allows us to do um, is uh, we don't have to worry about like worms or anything like that. So we're able to accept a lot of organic waste um, and we're considered an industrial facility, um, which is really cool because we are able to take all of the compostable packaging that a lot more businesses, if you've noticed, are starting to use. 
Um, so these containers, like their to-go containers or the uh, PLA plastic cups, things like that, we can actually accept and it will break down in our process. Um, our windrows are, are very big, so they generate a lot of heat. Um, and we're regulated by so we have to do things like every single week we take temperatures of our piles in three different areas and different depths. Um, and then we're constantly turning them as well to make sure that all of the organic waste that's going into the piles are getting that chance to go into kind of like the core of each pile and get the, the max amount of heat um, to break down. Um, and the whole process uh, to get like a usable pile of compost that you could then use in a garden, it can be as quick as three months. It probably would still be a little hot at that point, but um, at that point you could get the compost um, and then start putting it to use, which is pretty cool. Um, and we, again, since we're an industrial sized facility, we are actually able to, we do this year round. So there's no closing of the facility. Um, we are collecting all the time and the piles, um, even in the dead of winter, um, they're just so big that they're still generating the type of heat that we need to have all the contents break down into it. Um, now, it, you guys, in, um, I think most of you are, I'm assuming, are in Newmarket. Um, Newmarket, um, we, we service, you know, with our curbside program, but what's really cool is you're one of the towns that also um, the Newmarket Transfer Station has Mr. Fox bins located at it um, and have your own bucket of organic waste and you can bring it to your town transfer station, dump it into the Mr. Fox bin. And then we come around with our larger truck and we tip that once a week. Um, so, and that is through the town. So that doesn't cost you anything um, if you have like a, a transfer chain sticker. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like a little snapshot of like how the whole process works. Um, we're growing, um, actually COVID was, was kind of good for us um, in, a, in a way uh, because everybody was home and uh, doing a lot more cooking. Um, so composting kind of ramped up for us um, in terms of the residential side. We had a, a massive amount of um, people sign up um, and um, a lot of towns are also reviewing ways to cut down on their landfill, especially since the recycling kind of issue is um, a lot more apparent. They're trying to find ways they can really sort things. So um, we've had four different transfer stations um, sign up um, during this this time period too, which is really great because that gives a lot more people opportunity if they're not really sure what composting is or if they want to do the curbside program. This gives them an opportunity to, to try that out at the through their town level. Yeah. Does anybody have questions for me? I could clarify a little bit. I see on Instagram, you guys do a great job of reminding us periodically what is allowed to be in that or what are you encouraging us to, to put in the compost for you or for, for compost purposes. Also, um, I was interested, one of your posts really reminded us that something might say biodegradable, but that doesn't mean that it's ever gonna biodegrade if it goes in the regular garbage pickup. So can you give us a little overview about that, Jenny, about those two yes. things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so thank you for, for recognizing the Instagram. I do all of that. So that makes me really happy. <laughs> My hard work it's is- It's done really <laughs> well. I love it. Oh, good. <laughs> I work hard at it. So, um, but yeah, so uh, it's a good point. So uh, the, big, the big thing, I think that it's a big misconception and I was guilty of it too before I really kind of got into the nitty gritty of this industry. Um, a lot of people think like if I just throw my apple core or, or this product is says compostable, if I if it goes into the landfill bin, since it's if it's biodegradable, it's organic, it's going to break down anyway. And the truth is that um, that's not the case. Uh, landfills are, are are as we know they're really big. Um, all of the trash just compacts everything. So it just gets smothered um, and nothing is actually getting air to help break down those materials. 
so they're just getting stuck in the landfill um and every you know there's studies every once in a while and they do actually pour samples of these larger landfills and they will do pour samples where they find you know whole like apple pits uh, apple cores and uh, avocado pits that have been there for like 10 plus years and they just haven't broken down because they're just being smothered in these landfills um so it's it's important to know that the composting that we're doing is very different um in a landfill it's getting trapped it's trapping those dangerous gases it's releasing the methane when composting the way we're doing it so when we get that organic waste we combine it we have like a recipe basically and we're combining it with different amendments and then we're doing the turning of the piles every so many weeks there's a whole schedule to it so every pile is getting turned so many weeks um and this turning and this adding of the amendments is what's really actually kind of kicking off the scientific process to start breaking down all that material so that's why um you know when people say like oh it's but by that's that's great, but, but if it's not going to a composting facility, it's just going to end up in a landfill, um, which is one of the things that we really do try to kind of drive home, especially for some of these restaurants that they're they're doing they're doing their best while they're buying these compostable products like to go containers and cups that are compostable. But if they're not composting, it's still just going to end up in a landfill, unfortunately. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where everybody has to kind of get educated and take a step into the right direction. Um, so yeah, um, so that's a good, that's a good point. I saw a museum exhibit once in Manhattan that was all kind of uh, magazines and newspapers that were years and years and years old in pristine condition that had been dug up from landfills because no air mm -hmm. hit them. They were essentially like mm -hmm. mummified people magazine issues and whatnot. It's kind of, kind of creepy. But it drove the point home that there's no it's air is not circulating in there so nothing is degrading in there right correct yeah and it and it's crazy um so the the number that the community kind of tosses out there so it's kind of like a general number but um 25 percent of what goes into a landfill can actually be composted so that's quite a large number wow. um and so that's a lot a lot of uh diversion that we can do um and i think one of the things I, I really try to kind of get across to people is I think in this day and age, like being environmentally friendly or conscientious is really kind of like trending, um, which is great. It should be a trend forever. But um, I think people think like, okay, I'm going to be environmentally friendly. I'm going to try to look for solar panels or, or windmills or these like, they're great energy savers, but they cost a lot. They take a lot of time where you can sign up for composting or if your transfer station has composting, everybody makes organic waste. So you can literally start tomorrow if you want to. Um, and mm. diverting that organic waste, um, it's removing it from the landfill, which hopefully then will um, lower the amount of methane gases that are released. And then um, with our facility, we're the only facility from here to Maryland that does that offers a full circle compost program. And what that means is if you're a part of our program, you toss your organic waste into the bin, we compost it, it becomes soil. You can actually, we do a give back every spring, but you can also buy our soil back then to grow your food. And then when your food is grown, you can put it back in the, you know, if you're scraps, you can put it in the compost bin and then the, thus the circle is complete. So not many compost facilities can even do that and we're able to. so that's like that's the coolest thing i think about it that is cool i have a question jenny um mm -hmm. so if i'm living in an apartment or um you know a smaller house um what what's the best place for me to you know store my things that i'm going to take either to the, you know, the place at the new market landfill where I can then, you know, drop it off. Or even if I'm getting pickup from you guys, I'm assuming it's once a week, right? Is that when the pickup um, is? New market, we're on a bi, we only go there bi-weekly. So it's okay. going to be okay. bi-weekly, which okay. is actually the most common plan. Uh, most people do only bi-weekly anyway. So do you guys have like a best practice or uh, suggestions for how people can store that food waste? um 
I mean, I, I have my own compost, so I just have a bucket under my sink that I put it in. But for a lot of people, I know that's, that is a barrier for them, right? They, they don't have an easy way to store it, but I think if we could help them to know how to do that, we might get more takers. Because we have a lot yeah. of people living in apartments or small homes in Newmarket. Yeah, no, absolutely. I used to live in Newmarket. I love Newmarket. Um, yeah, so um, we actually service a lot of different apartment complexes. Um, and usually what the, my, I don't know, I think I always, I always recommend tenants that are signing up uh, to just check with their facilities manager or the property manager if they have one to make sure that when they put their bin out, that's okay, or where they want them to put the bin out. I think a lot of people also are in apartment buildings and then they just, they just sign up because they want to compost and hope, you know, hopefully <laughs> hope for the best. Um, the, in terms of storing it, um, so the way that I, the way that I do it personally is I have a little countertop bin that I keep under my sink and I have a small compostable liner in that. And then as that gets filled, I take that little liner bag and then I put it in my bigger Mr. Com uh, Mr. Fox bin. Now, if you, if you do have, if you have a Mr. Fox bin, the lid that we have, if you, if you snap it on tight enough, like it really traps in all the, the smell and everything. And it has like a little flap. So you can just flap lid and put your stuff into it. Um, I recommend trying to keep it in a cool location. So like if, you know, winter is great because a lot of people just keep it on their porch or on their front stoop. Um, if you don't have that luxury, um, you can keep it inside. Um, some people will, every time they put in, uh, or they have, just like a little scoop of baking soda and they just sprinkle it um, or yeah, uh, on top of it to kind of keep the smell down if there is a smell. And then the other thing that a lot of people do um, is they have the organic waste in their compostable bags and then they, um, they freeze it. And when it's their compost day or the night before, they take out all the blocks of the compost, put it in the bin and then they leave it out. Um, obviously, I don't know if your storage space in terms of how much freezer you room you have but um if you do bi-weekly and you're in an apartment um that that's that's a common one that people do is, is store their stuff in the, in the freezer do you sell it do you sell the compost other other than to just the customers oh yes yep yep um so um, if you're a customer, um, in the spring, we do a give back of, you get a complimentary bag of, um, compost from us. Um, and we give that back in burlap sacks. Um, that way, uh, the customer can use the burlap bag to make compost tea, or if they don't want to use the, the burlap bag that can go right into the compost bin and, um, it'll be able to break down in our facility. Um, but we'll, bulk compost so it's a two yard minimum um so we sell that all over and then we also sell wholesale to local like landscapers uh gardening centers as well i have a, a question i had two questions but patrick asked one of my questions already so that was great um because i live in a small apartment and my kitchen has no ventilation um, my other question is right now I'm just bringing my compost, uh, my food scraps in a really like a basically a big yogurt container to work because we have a worm composter. Um, oh, okay. But that has limitations because there are certain foods you can't put in there, but it sounds like you don't have any limitations when it comes to food scraps. Yeah, um, so good point. Um, yeah, so again, kind of going back to the whole like industrial facility and we don't use worms or any of that we're able to accept a whole lot more. So we're able to accept like pretty much any food scrap. We're able to accept any sort of shellfish, um, bones, meat, dairy. Um, we can accept, I mean, like um, soiled uh, pizza boxes. We can accept uh, egg cartons, um, bamboo uh, products. We can accept all of the compostable packaging that's certified um, compostable. Um, so yeah, we can, it can have, it's, it's a lot like when you're doing like, oh, I could put this in there. It, it's quite a bit and you don't have to really think too much about it, which is great. And then also back to the smell thing, you were saying, you know, the, 
the small apartment with low ventilation. Um, so the compost, it really doesn't smell all that bad. Even when you put things in it, I find, um, and I think a lot of people get surprised by that, but it's just the bin, like if you snap that lid on tight, it, you really don't smell, smell it too much, so. Great. So the compostable packaging includes the, the plastic, like, like coffee cups, for example, as well, as yeah. long as it says certified uh, so, compostable. Yes, correct. Um, so it would be uh, the PLA number seven. Mm -hmm. um, that's the big thing to kind of look for. Um, now, don't be confused. Uh, there is a plastic number seven. Um, so the the key indicator is that it's a uh, the the recycle symbol with the seven, and then it usually has PLA either under or next to it. And the PLA basically is standing for it's a plant based product, um, which means that it's made of corn or or what have you. So that can be compostable. Um, in places like uh, Big Bean, um, they use compostable packaging. Um, yeah. Thank you. I have a quick question for you. Um, I know when we started the program in town at the transfer station, we were not allowing folks to bring pizza boxes and, and whatnot because we felt there was too much bulk because we got the smaller bins. And uh, I just yeah. don't know if, if, if you happen to know if, because I, I, you know, we obviously now with, with the COVID, we've gotten much more takeout than typical. And now, thankfully, at least it's not just pure plastic, it's supposedly compostable. And I run compost here at home, so I don't usually take stuff to the transfer station. But those items specifically, I'm not an industrial composter at home, obviously. Right. So um, do you happen to know, I haven't followed since I was off the, that committee, um, if our town accepts the, um, I, I don't know, if, I don't think they do pizza boxes yet, but do you know if they accept, like, can I, can I just save up my, my to-go containers and bring them to the town transfer station and put them in that in, in, in the bins there? Or is that better asked at the town level instead of asking you? Yeah, I mean, so when we when we set up um, a transfer station, we, we, we try to make everything really simple. We make, try to make it simple for our residential customers and our commercial customers. And so we just tell them the same. Yeah, like we'll accept all of it. So if the town has some sort of regulation where they don't want pizza boxes going in or whatever, I guess that's to the town. And to them, I would just say, like, well, it's diverting the waste. So, like, why? Yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, the, reason, the, re, the reasoning originally was, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, is we were trying to pitch it as a, as a cost offsetting because we remove the heaviest items, right? right? We're taking the organic waste out, and we pay by weight to dispose of yeah. the other trash in town. So if we remove yeah. the weight... You know that it will save the town money and therefore we can get these comp pay for the compost bins <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so that that was kind of the, the angle and um so mm -hmm. that's why we have the small ones and i think the bigger bins which if everybody in town brought their pizza boxes there there would be like a tremendous amount of pizza boxes which would never fit in the little the little rollaways you know the little guys um yeah um so so yeah so maybe it's a it's it's yeah approach at the town level for getting a different <laughs> yeah bin. i mean i think like i'm other towns, I mean, they put the pizza box, people just go because they are familiar with maybe Mr. Fox in general, they'll like put pizza boxes in and they definitely put all the to go containers. And there is a little bit of like an educational like curve for the people who are the actual attendants at the station, because sometimes they're like, no, you, that's recyclable or whatever. And, yeah. you know, you kind of have to educate them like, well, yeah, but like, it can go in the bin. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we encourage like all of that. I mean, if, especially if restaurants are, if they're using compostable packaging, they're they're paying more for those those products because they're compostable. So we might as well like do them the favor of actually composting it as opposed to you know going. They're, what they're trying to for is you know to get it diverted from the landfill. So. Great, excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jenny, do you have? Um sort of a general fact sheet about composting um, with Mr. Fox or that I'm just thinking it, I'm, I'm putting together something for recycling because we had the recycling company come out. So that was really helpful. So I've 
kind of gone back and forth them a couple times and now I've got that covered and I want to put that out to people in the town. It would be nice if we could put something together for composting and, you know, it could cover everything. I'd like to cover everything. So the Mr. Fox option, taking it. Oh. Did I get cut off there? Yeah, sorry. So I wanted to kind of cover that so that if some, because we do get a lot of general questions where people will be like, to town, I want to know about composting. And I would like to have something that kind of covered all the options that they have. Like if you want to do it at home, here's how to do it. If you want to do, have someone pick it up, here's how to do it. If you're going to bring it to the landfill, here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. So even if you're uh, just covering your end, that would be really helpful to have. Yeah, um, I mean, I have a lot of different types of uh, documentation and I'm more than happy to send them on over to you. Um, and then if it's still not quite what you're looking for, um, I can, like, if you have a list of questions that have already been asked or that you'd like as like a guideline, like I'm more than happy to create something for you guys. I think we've covered a lot of them actually tonight that I've seen. Um, I think usually the biggest ones are, can I do it? How do I do it? And what can I put in it? Those are, mm -hmm. those are really the three questions. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, just let, if you, yeah, I'll send over uh, what documentation I have and you can Thank take you. a look at it. And if there's something that you're, you're not seeing, I can probably make it for you. All right, thank you. Chris, the, um, Chris does, the, does the Environment and Energy Committee have that, that list together? Because I believe we, we, we kind of, that the Mr. Fox option at the transfer station came out of the Environment and Energy Committee time we kind of had a list maybe and I, I don't know where it's at these days if, if it's even discussed on that board anymore. I will tell you that Tony Weinstein has been integral in that um, regard about composting and about the, the whole recycling thing so let me ask her because lately our thrust has been about energy on, a, on the solar panels and that kind of discussion with um, um, electric opportunity opportunities with electric with electricity sorry so let me research that a little bit because that predates me i have been on the I'm, i am on e and e but um only for the last couple of months so thank you for bringing that up jeff um i'll find out i'm running it down right now thank you mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for Jenny? Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's wonderful to, to learn more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Now you don't have to commute home. You can just leave meeting and there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, um, email the customer service box at Mr. Fox and you know we'll get back to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, bye. Okay, so um, I wanted to turn it over to Melissa Brogel who had a project she wanted to talk about with the Cemetery Commission. Yeah, so um, I, during the week-long cleanup that I helped organize, um, Stacy, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Stacy Mazur um, on the trustees <clears throat> for the cemeteries, uh, Facebook messaged me and let me know that the hill between um, the Calvary Cemetery and the Industrial Park is just full of debris from the cemetery. So like the wire things from wreaths and planter pots and a bunch of stuff like that so um she was curious about maybe teaming up with the conservation commission to do a cleanup there um so i just kind of wanted to open it up i mean i'm pretty much always willing to do cleanups so i i could just go with her or the um the trustees and and do it but i i also wanted to open it up to the group and see if there was any other interest um in doing that yeah i mean i would volunteer for that that's fine should we do we want to maybe toss it out to the board something like that yeah i was curious if anyone kind of 
had ideas for that too. Um, there's the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and um, the local basketball team that also helped that week during the cleanup. That's um, he said the coach said they're always looking for community service events too. So yeah. uh, it could be kind of like a fun, almost like kids event, <laughs> which would be really fun. <laughs> Sounds good. I think you should you should get a date out there, and then we can all sort of focus on promoting it. Okay. Sounds like great. a good idea. All right. I will do that. Okay. So we had next on the agenda, we have 75 Neil Mill Road, but um, I actually created this before I knew that we were going to have a planning board rep here tonight. So I thought it might help actually to start with updates from uh, the planning board and town council um, in case they have anything regarding 75 Neil Mill Road to share before we move to that agenda item. So Jeff, do you want to start since you guys just met recently? Just trying to pull some things up here on this other uh, screen. So we did meet on Tuesday evening and discuss the, um, the project that's 75 Neil Mill Road. Um, a motion was put forward, which was um, slightly lengthy and um, there was some discussion regarding it. <laughs> and essentially, I, I, I guess the, without getting into too much detail, I, I was able to get a draft copy of the motion. So if there are questions to the specifics, I, I, I do have that document um, when it's finalized um, and reviewed by the by the um, by the planning board chair, I will be able to share it, but not I can't share the document itself until that time until it's finalized. Um, so I guess to say the general gist of it was to um, to kind of give guidance to the town council as to the, you know, what, what they should be looking for in an application um, for that building permit um, and not to have, have the through design, you know, full roadway design um, without knowing if the town council would be willing to to allow the building permit in the first place. Um, so that that was kind of the the thought, and that the the um, the planning board's role is essentially to review what's provided, what's initially provided, and give the guidance as to what maybe you know if it were more complete, perhaps we would have offered <laughs> more input but um, we offered input on what was provided and then um, steps that we think would be proper for the town council to take as far as further review more or less <laughs> so that 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 is um, you know the motion was presented it was amended to say essentially that the um, the town council, if they so desire to um, allow it to happen, to um, you know, and they, and they want the planning board to provide technical review assistance, then the planning board would would you know would do so as the town council asked, and um, that if the town council decided to not a building permit on Neil Mill Road for whatever reason it be, that um, they entertain the idea of turning the, um, the roadway into a class A trail. Um, so it's kind of where it stands right now. It's more or less in the hands of the town council. I hope I explained it okay. <laughs> the motion was, re was, was lengthy and, and at, at the time it was read and um, I, I, I kind of tried to get the gist of it then, but I just kind of received it relatively recently. So there are questions I can pull it up on my end and, and, and answer them and I hope that helps <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Jeff
Okay. Well, thank you. Um, sure. Was it, yeah. Um, was it that that was that was that the only thing on the agenda on Tuesday, or did you guys have anything else that you think is important for us to know? There were a number. There there was more than typical, um, but I don't think that there's anything else that I would think that the that the uh, commission would be interested in. Um, Seventy five mil mill road would be, I think, the headline. And, and like I said, I, I'm more than happy to discuss further if folks have questions and, and I can do my best at answering them. Okay. But, um, and if, if the if the commission does certainly, uh, obviously the 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 the, um, the motion that we're going to provide to the town council will certainly become public. You know, when when it's it's finalized, essentially it was read, put down on paper. And just needs final review and sign off by the chairman of the, of the planning board to make sure that it was drafted properly. Okay. Megan, town council. Um, thank you. And I don't definitely don't have anything to add to that. Um, that hasn't come to town council yet. Nothing that I could add that would be more in depth than, than what Jeff would be able to share. Um, yeah, and nothing that's specifically of interest, I think, to the Conservation Commission. I do just, in any space I'm in, want to be clear that um, the mask ordinance is still in place. Um, I know the CDC guidelines just changed again, so there's been a lot of questions about that. Um, but um, the ordinance is still in place, but other than that, nothing nothing conservation related. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll now move on to the agenda item that is listed as 75 Mill Mill Road. Um, I shared a few documents with you. Um, I shared the letter that we received from the Newfields uh, Conservation Commission that was shared. It was, I believe, it was actually addressed, and then the town planner shared it with me. Um, and then I shared uh, with you the most recent letter that was received by um, the planning board from. Southeast Land Trust, which was written by Dwayne Hyde. And I think those are two very important documents because um, those are other property abutters out there in addition to the properties that were responsible for Silverman Schneer. Um, and then last but not least, I shared, Ellen has shared her letter that she has drafted um, which is really the focal point of what we're going to be talking about tonight, um, where she summarizes the issues and concerns out there at 75 Mill Mill Road. And when I say 75 Mill Mill Road, it's not really with a house to be built because that's not really the issue. It's the driveway, obviously, is the issue. Um, because you can't have the house out there without those changes to the current class six road and it's I believe 700 feet or is it 700 yards jeff i can't recall now hey, it's feet 700 feet, 700 feet that there's proposing so i think the I think, I think they might actually be further out i thought it was 12 was it not 1200 Just well like supposedly the the distance from the end of the class five road to where their driveway will cut into the field is 750 but it kind of points out the fact that we don't have a the, the plan is not super detailed what they provide so far it's kind of one of the issues or a big issue so i think it might be most helpful alan to hear from you and to, to, if you want to outline the most important parts of what you've written um so that we can make sure that those anyone has any questions about those points that you made sure i'd be happy to um i'm sorry it was it i sent it this morning and it's fairly long but as jeff said they just met tuesday night and i had to listen to what they were actually going to do to know what um what i thought we should discuss so as i said in my letter um they've discussed this four times it was first presented in february and it was at that period where the planning board was assuming they'd have a site walk and that they would get more information and um, sort of the subsequent meetings that I think I'm not really sure why those things didn't happen, but eventually it came down to now this last the planning board's like, well, we need more information. 
I think is kind of what people feel, but that's costly. So if the council is going to say no anyway, why make them go through that? So it's kind of a chicken and egg. We can't really assess all the potential impact without a more detailed plan from the applicants. So, so we either have to go with what we got, um, and you've read the letters from Celt. You, the town, the attorney for Celt spoke at, at a couple of the meetings, as did the attorney for the applicants, and. Um, none of those issues have really been sort of discussed through. They've been presented by the abutters and by the attorneys, but the planning board didn't like hash them out um, and discuss them. So again, those issues are out there. The use of that public way by a private driveway, we have no detail about how they're gonna accommodate recreational access, uh, winter year round recreational access. What's the tread gonna be like? Are they gonna cut trees? you know, really what the impact is on that public way. It's a public resource, it's our community resource. So I think the town has an obligation to understand fully what that private use of our public way will be. And I don't think we have enough information to, to make that determination. The information we have so far doesn't indicate any positive impacts to the, any positives to the town. There's no benefit to the town of having a private road, private driveway over a public way. Um, so I try to look at, you know, we don't have enough information in terms of an engineering plan. It's not really clear how the public access is going to be accommodated as well as restricted in terms of there's already, there's a gate there, then that seems that has limited our, you know, off road vehicle access that hasn't really been sorted out. Um, we, and as we know, we have very significant ecological features out there, including the two properties that, that the town holds easement on where the driveway would uh, pass by. And so it's our obligation to make sure we're protecting the interests of those, um, the, the easements which the town holds. So I tried to go back and look at the master plan, which is really the guiding document that we're supposed to use for decision-making. And I think the planning board motion mentioned the master plan um, and I think it says that it, it, it does, it's not in opposition to the master plan, which I would disagree with because <clears throat> I think, again, we don't, we, there's no way we have enough information to say for sure that it, it isn't in the master plan. And again, I think if you look at the master plan, it's actually not, not in concert with the master plan because we it talks about infill development and it talks about protecting all these really important natural resources protecting our drinking water um and this will not do that this is a a really scattered potential house out in a very unfragmented part of town that has a lot of important resources um so i talked about the master plan i talked about the two conservation easements that the town holds as you know, we've committed a lot of funding to help protect land out there, both recently with the Tucker Track and earlier with the, the Kuskasi Greenway. Uh, the town is putting the well in at the Tucker property. So there's a lot of investment that we've put into that region. Uh, let's see. And then the um, fact that the town of Newfields, the, the citizens designated their two roads, Oldie Road and Halls Mill Road as Class A trails. Um, that just sort of really highlights the fact that, you know, we should have done this at our, on our sections as well. And maybe we can get to that point um, here. And then I just included references to the ecological significance of the, the region. So, you know, I thought about this um, and we could say, well, we don't have enough information so the council should send it back to the planning board, but that's kind of what they did in the first place. So if we, if, if it's my contention that this is such a significant region for ecological features, drinking water resources, recreational resources, it's a public way. These are our community resources. The council in its purview can say, no, we don't think this is something we want to permit and can deny it on those grounds. And we could then proceed with making it a class A trail, which is really what it should be, in my opinion. So, 
anyone have any questions for Ellen or comments? I want to compliment Ellen on this write up. It's a, it's amazing. Fantastic letter. Thank you for, for doing this. Thank you. Got great info. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my concerns are, you know, the, in the minutia, things like if they're plowing, you know, you mentioned in the letter, where's it going to go? Or maybe the salt letter mentioned that. What about salt? You know, where does that end up? And if there's maintenance on that 700 foot stretch, who is who's responsible for the upkeep of that? Is it the town? If the, if the road starts to give way or, you know, if they... Yeah, I think one of the things to keep in mind is it's always difficult when you have an applicant in front of you, you know, you know these, these people are very nice and, and they're interested in doing this and they have, um, you know, they may be interested in conservation or doing things the right way or what have you, but this is in perpetuity. You have to, ex you have to remove that applicant from the idea of this is, this is allowed or not allowed because down the road, somebody else is gonna live there and they may do very different things that are very harmful that we thought, wow, I didn't think that was going to happen out there, but we have no controls over what would happen out there once the property is allowed to build. So I think it's really important that we think about this in perpetuity and not think about this current applicant. Um, so, mm -hmm. and, and the self laid out lots of, of various, you know, those are other sort of town. I don't, I didn't really want to get into all the other sort of town issues because I think I tried to really still stay focused on these natural, cultural, recreational resources, which I think is our purview. There's a whole bunch of other town issues that presumably the council will discuss. I want to do, ditto what Melissa said about thank you for putting all the information in such a comprehensive manner and lay it out and remind us of the history. Because on the one hand, it feels like, excuse me, <clears throat> this has been going on forever and you've really uh, compressed it for us. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a quick question. Um, is that this property has not been sold right? Is that correct? The people wanting to b uh, build a house haven't purchased it. Right. I, I, they, we actually have seen their purchase and sales. It's pending approval, I believe, if they get a permit. Also, a great report. I learned a lot by just reading the report you put together. Thank you. Could you give a little synopsis? What is it, uh, the trail you're referring to, or the definition of the, of the 1A trail? The Class A trail. So, class A, sorry. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on <laughs> Class 6 roads and Class A trails. The, the state laws are a little confusing, but a Class 6 road, you actually can't, you can't gate it and lock it you have to allow public in. So even though there's a gate, it does prevent most people from going through. And the town is not allowed to put any money into a class six road. And typically, you know, there's not, we don't have, this is the only one besides Hershey Lane. We've got two left in town. A class A trail um, essentially makes it a trail. It's no longer a road. So you don't have, uh, you can put a gate and lock the gate. It's really for a recreational passage. Um, it's, it would still allow management access. So if SELT wanted to do forestry or other management, if this landowner wanted to do field mowing, you know, that access is still allowed. It's just, you're allowed to gate it. And then the town is allowed to put in resources to make, you know, do stuff to the trail to make it better. So making, recommending, or the, if the end product is making it a trail, that would be the new in perpetuity standard that all other decisions would ever be based on, correct? Well, it's actually, um, so I, it has to go to the town warrants. The council, if, if, if it went this way, the council would say, yeah, we think it, we should think it should be a class A trail. And I think it becomes a warrant article and the citizens vote on it. Gotcha. Thank you. That it's was the little, piece I was. It's a little, I don't, um, I'm certain that the applicant or the underlying landowner will have an issue because I, when there's an abutter who may not support the idea of it being a class A trail and they have frontage, I'm certain there's a legal issue with that. But, you know, that's what we do as a community. We make decisions, 
basically the limitations and I think right. in case it the 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 values of that area so outweigh um that we need to we need to assume that there could be some legal action that we need to take you know I think we just have to go in with that assumption that this is not just like oh yeah okay let's make it a trail and everybody's gonna be very happy that's probably not you know gonna be completely the way it would work but it reverts to the idea of the greater good for the most people for the longest time rather than the unknown of what would happen if it were to become a one home one family um incident let's say right and we're not we're not um you know really is the fact that they're using this public way you know we're losing over right. 700 feet of the public way and everything stems from that and so if they were only going to go in 20 feet and then the property was right there it probably wouldn't be as big but they're they're going way into this unfragmented area and they're using the public way and we've got land on either side so it's yeah there's just a lot of public value there and the town has to look out for what potential economic liability it may have based on that development out there you know so the economic that, liability is huge yeah potentially we just yeah i'm interested in how much more we know now than we even did 10 or 15 years ago about the unfragmented um wa uh, not walkways but corridors for wildlife and and how much more we know i mean 15 years ago except for people in your profession ellen but but um regular people who are interested in ecology might not have thought of the unfragmented. We thought it was okay in planning to have this neighborhood had this much land around it. And then we had a neighborhood over here, and then we had a neighborhood over here. But in fact, we had bisected a, a migratory path, for instance. We just didn't know that much about it that long ago. So I think the unfragmented piece, along with some of the ideas that we've been aware of through the Newfields perspective is, is paramount here, I think. Yeah corridor for people and nature yeah yeah and just to add on to what ellen said i did find it just now but uh when newfield switched it from class six road to class a trail it did go via warrant article it's on their 2019 articles yeah i think i actually included it, and the vote was pretty pretty significantly um i think i might have actually included that now that I, yeah it was like 365 to 75 yeah. and that was true for both old lee road and um, but they're in it's called uh, Halls Mill Road. Halls Mill Road. Yeah. So Neil Mill Road becomes Halls Mill Road in Newfields. So right at the town line, it becomes a Class Eight trail in Newfields. So it's still a Class Six. And the same with Old Lee Road. Ours is still a Class Six. And then the Old Lee, or the Newfield piece, is a Class Eight trail. And and just to clarify, uh, the change of status to the Class A trail would not uh, curtail any of the current activities that occur in terms of snowmobiling, mountain biking, horseback riding, uh, walking. Um, I think there's portions of the land out there that people are allowed to hunt, not every part of the property, but so it doesn't, it doesn't change what the property is primarily being used for today, which is recreation, um, wildlife viewing, you know, fishing, things like that. So no change to how the land is currently being used and Southeast Land Trust or any other property holder out there that needs to manage their land. So mowing, timber, construction, and, you know, of bridges and so on, things like that, that's still permitted as well. So um, in, in a lot of ways, what we're really looking at here is how do we best maintain what we have today, which we think has significant value. I would say if anything that this last year has taught us is that the value of the recreational opportunities and lands that we have in New Market went up tremendously because people discovered the value of being able to go to the property that is close to their homes and use it and get outside and you know with their families. I just think that 
that it adds so much to our town to have properties like that. It's a very significant economic value that I think people are looking at right now. So in the future, when people say, I'm going to move to a place, one of the things they'll look at is what, what are my opportunities in that place to recreate outdoors? Do they have open space? Do they have parks? Do they have conserved land? Can I ride my bike, cross country ski, bird watch, wh whatever it may be. So I think that um, one of the things that we're looking out for in, in this approach is, is that, is just to say, we think there's a tremendous value. There's been a tremendous investment it's actually increased in value, I think is what we've discovered over the past year. And we wanna preserve that. We don't want to lose, lose that investment that we've made in all these public lands and this, this wonderful trail system that we have that we, we feel, or I feel, and I think Ellen's letter reflects this, is at risk. This, the, the, one of the things that this uh, change in status of this public way would do would, would put that current status at risk I feel it would change the nature of the access point that we have today to all of the land that's out there in Newmarket and Newfield that all of us get to enjoy and so for me uh, the reason I would support this letter would be that I don't I don't want to see that go away I think there's such a value there and it's such an important piece of, of, of lands that have been put together by a coalition of groups and people that this, this is where we need to make a stand. So um, I guess that, that'd be my starting point as to why I would support a motion to uh, put this forward as our letter, this project, um, how we feel about it. Are you looking for a motion to that effect? No, that, 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 I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll make a motion that oh. we submit this letter as the letter from the Conservation Commission regarding the proposed project of 75 North Margaret Road. Second that. Any other discussion or questions? Sorry, was that Melissa Sharples? Yes. OK. OK. All actually, in favor? Actually, can I oh, ask a sorry, quick question? Jeff. Can I yeah. ask a quick question? I, I do not recall if the planning board member is a voting member. You are. And um, I also just want to point out that I, I appreciate how Ellen has included both the portions of Paul's Mill uh, or Neil Mill and Old Lee Road <laughs> in, in this letter to the um, potential Class A trails. Okay, so why don't you call the roll on the motion as it stands now? Patrick Reynolds? Yeah, aye. Jeff Goldenhoff? Aye. Ellen Snyder? Aye. Melissa um, Sharples? Aye. Aye. Chris Blackstone? Aye. Kenny? Aye. Okay. It's a 7 0 0. Thank you. That's so great. Uh, Patrick, I can redraft this and send it to you and you would sign it, I assume, and send it on or? I shall do that. I think I think since it was 7-0, we should put everybody's name on it though, just yeah. sort sure. of modeling it after what Newfields did. I, I thought that was a good approach just to show that we're all in agreement on this. Great, wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Can I mention one, one other thing real quick? Oops, sorry, you would like to have something? Dude, did you have a question? I had a question for Jeff. Last night when um, uh, Val was reading the motion the second time, I taped it and I, and I heard some mention about a law, um, like a, a law class on class six roads or something like that as mentioned in it. Yeah, there, there's um, a book in, in a series of seminars, I guess we'll say, as, uh, is it Hard Road to Travel? Yeah. It's a book that's widely cited by surveyors and people that deal with classics roads. Essentially, essentially gets into road, road law. 
Um, I did not attend that. I wasn't able to, unfortunately. Okay, so that's what they were referring back to, that everyone had to look at what is said about plastic straws? Um, it, it, it could be. I, I might, I, I don't know that I'm remembering the exact moment. <laughs> There's an, there's there's RSAs regarding plastic roads. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's what you're 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 getting. Is is that it? Yeah. I mean, oh. the motion was almost six minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me take a look at the motion and see. So it's part of the motion. It was. There was a mention of RSA 231, which has to do with emergency vehicle access, or I believe. Okay. It, it says, uh, well, it might not. It says, and any requirements dictated by RSA 231. That is not the RSA specific to Class 6 roads, though. I'm not 100% familiar with RSA 231, let's say. I was there, listening. The, the third review of RSA 67441, public hearing, that, that, that has to do with the public hearing on Class 6 roads. I was listening, and I think I recall that as being like, she, Val Felton was just sort of listing of all the various sources of information that had come in, and that was one source had been to that seminar, I think. The seminar, yes. As I, rem as I remember what she was speaking about. Yes, exactly. And so, so one thing I was going to point out real quick that I just wanted to mention was that any documents that are referenced or cited or, or talked about at the planning board are typically within the planning board agenda. So if you go to the um, town's website and open up that planning board agenda, um, that's that's listed under each meet. Um, you can go there and you can pull up any agenda. The agenda is like 70 pages long, and there's a whole host of, of information on that 75 mil mill road project. All the letters that have been submitted by various people and organizations um, are, are all kind of attached to the agenda. It's actually 177 pages. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. Quick we read. Don't have, we don't have an agenda that long, do we, Patrick? No. I, I've never seen a ComCom -com agenda that long. <laughs> okay. Jeff, did you have another question? You were starting to raise your hand for a question. Did you have another? Uh, no, I was just simply going to point out that all that documentation is there um, okay. for folks to go get. That, that, that was all I was going to mention. Okay. Can I ask one clarifying question? Um, I'm listing the name of the, the people that were able to vote, or is that every? I don't know how to. That that would be. Um, I think it's okay to list everybody who voted yes. So Melissa, I, I, she wasn't voting, but can I list her or not list? I just want to make sure I, you know, do it right. So it's fine with me if you do, but because um, if I was a voting member, I would have voted the same way. But if okay, we'll put you down as alternate, alternate, and you said yeah, you, yeah. Okay. I, can, I think as long as she's listed as alternate, that's okay. probably fine. Let's do that. Very good. Thank you, Megan. Megan is uh, ex officio town council voting, non voting. Ex officio. Okay. Would I list you on there then, Megan, or not? Um, I share your opinion, so I'm fine with my name being listed on there. Okay. Protocol-wise, I'm not sure. As long as it says ex Melissa ex officio, it, it's allowed. Oh, well, I don't want to say. It is allowed with anyone who is ex officio. You or not you or anybody in any town, so... I would encourage, I mean, I, I don't know if the, 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 the commission or, or Meg, Megan, this wouldn't be on the town council's agenda, obviously, as of yet. I don't, I don't know how far out something like this would be or how long it takes to get on that agenda. Um, I, I mean, if it, if it gets to Wendy by Friday, then it would be on next week's agenda. Okay. I don't know if the, town, if the conservation commission wants to send the representative to speak even for, along with the letter. It might it might have a little more impact at all. Well, my my feeling is when it gets on the agenda, we should we should definitely be there to um, to speak on it. I'm not sure if it isn't on the agenda yet that there's much to say 
Um, but we'll certainly send this letter along to them and share it with them. And I'll, you know, CC the planning board as well. But yeah, I kind of look for the town council to get on the agenda. And I would assume it would have to be on the agenda multiple times, right? Because you do it, you're not going to vote on the first time you have it on the agenda, probably. So, so there's yeah, going to be. Yeah, so it would be first reading and then two weeks yeah, later. Yeah. Yep. That's the discussion. So, um, but I, as soon as I find out it's on the agenda, I will blast out an email to everybody so that uh, everyone knows that. So, if anyone wants to go speak, they can. Just going to have a quick turnaround. I mean, Ellen's got the draft and we didn't make any amendments to the draft, right? Right. You're on mute still, Ellen. I'll run it by Patrick so make sure we've got it, you know, the names listed properly. Before we send it. Okay. Did everyone get a chance to review the minutes from our meeting on April 8th? Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. And was that a second from you, Chris? Sure, thank yes. <laughs> I was so moving and then she did, so I'll second. Okay. Uh, Sue, do you wanna call a roll on that? You're on mute. Jeff Golnoff. Abstain. Abstain. Yes, I was not present. <laughs> uh, Patrick Reynolds. Aye. Ellen Snyder. Aye. David Bell. Aye. Sam Kenny. Aye. Chris Blackstone. Aye. Melissa Sharples. Aye. Thank you. Six one. Oh no. Six zero one. With Jeff abstaining. Okay. So let me go over everything I've got on here. I skipped over this item, so I'll come back to it. So, um, we have a request from the Newmarket Freemasons to use Shanda Park on Saturday, uh, 10 to two ish. Um, they're going to do a commemorative ceremony for um, Mr. Shanda, who was one of their founding members who they made a large donation to Shanda Park in honor of just to have a ceremony in his honor there. So I have a permit for a request to do that ceremony. Um, and I would like to see if I have a motion to accept that. Uh, Saturday, like the day after tomorrow? Yes, yes, it was short notice. There isn't anyone else scheduled to use the park that day. I'll make a motion to approve the permit. Thanks, Sam. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Jeff, are you abstaining again? Because you weren't. Oh, no. Uh, oh, okay. no, no, no. Just want to make sure. Okay. Sorry, I had, my, I had my hand up as an eye, but I was still muted. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so un under the chair's report, I've got one a um, couple of items. One, we're, we're going to talk about the, the Wigan Farm signs that Ellen distributed. So we'll cover that in just a second. Um, but I, a couple of other things, just brief things. Um, I had a request from some folks out at Moody Point about the rain barrels. Now, those of you they go back a ways with the Conservation Commission. We'll recall, I believe when Fred Pearson was on the Conservation Commission, we purchased a bunch of rain barrels, which Fred was then kind enough to store. I believe he had a barn on his property. So he, store, he stored the rain barrels on his property and then people could come buy rain barrels and he was sort of our rain barrel dealer. But um, once Fred was no longer on the commission, we, we didn't continue that program primarily because we did not have a good 
place to store rain barrels and then also be someone who would be willing to sort of be the de facto rain barrel dealer for us because i mean the program wasn't money making i think we were ordering the barrels and and by ordering you know a larger number we got a better price and then we sold them to the public at that same price because we we're you know it was a public service does that sound right jeff and ellen does that does that sound right as you guys remember the rain barrel program yeah, we, we did rain barrels and composters, and we purchased them at cost. Uh, sorry, we purchased them in bulk, and then they, they were initially stored in Fred's, you know, the loft of his barn, and then they were sold to folks in actually in Newmarket and surrounding towns for um, yeah. the cost they were purchased at. And then eventually we were told that we were not allowed to keep them on private essentially they were town property being stored on private property. <laughs> oh, okay. So we attempted to move them to DPW, and, uh, you know, we tried, you know, can we do that at the transfer station? And people didn't want to babysit them over there and, and kind of, so uh, the program, I believe, faded out at that point. And it was around the time Fred left. It might have even been just before he left the commission yeah. um, that we stopped um, dealing with those. Or maybe he had a couple left and then they, they were gone. But. So, um, Dover, uh, so there's company called the Great American Rain Barrel Company, which is maybe where the rain barrels were purchased from, and they have community programs, and I did one in Dover with the Dover Democrats, I'm not sure why they, if there was a fundraiser for them or how that worked, but um, I just got one, you ordered it, it's over now, they did it, and they, there must have been hundreds, so it's one day, You all, everybody goes there to pick up their rain barrel on that day, it's like about a month ago, um, and I love my rain barrel, <laughs> it's really nice, so I can see why people want them, but we might, if, I don't know what the interest is out there, but to me, that's the way you might want to go about it is you do a program with them and then you, there's a day where everybody, people order it and then you go pick up your barrel on that day. Yeah, yeah a I finite think, window. I think that that's yeah. worked in a couple of communities. Yeah. yeah, we got one for work through that same exact um, yeah. program, Ellen, and it was pretty smooth. So I would agree with you on Maybe that's the way to go. So you think we'd want to organize an event or do you think we should reach out and see if there's any more events in the seacoast and then maybe we could that give, that inf yeah. give that information out to the public? That's what I would do personally, yeah. Yeah, all right. You can just go on their website, Great American uh, Rain Barrel Company and they'll tell you what community programs, who, what towns might have a program going. I, okay. I know that when I know that when we purchased them and, and did happen in, in like uh, I don't know Fred used to always say that he felt like that the the market was saturated as kind of a joke but um, it, it would happen like you wouldn't sell any for months and then all of a sudden you'd sell like six of them you know <laughs> and then right. we'd hem and haw as to whether we should order ten more or twenty more or thirty more it was like such an unknown and then they'd just be they'd sit there for a long time then they'd all get sold all of a sudden so the idea of a single yeah, and then these are, you order it, so there's no inventory. Everybody, yeah. you order it, exactly. you, know, you get your barrel. It's, exactly. That sounds like a great idea to organize a, a single event. Okay. Um, the next thing I had was I just wanted to, to kind of give everyone an update on this. So the state I got notice from the state that they had closed the herring fishery down on – for the entire state of New Hampshire. So um, as you guys know, we have the fish weir here in um, Newmarket and the reason we interact with it is he, uh, the guy who operates it, Jerry Collins, stores it on at Shanda Park. So when the industry or fishery was closed, um, I reached out to Jerry and I said, probably don't want to have the, the fish we're sitting there all summer uh, on on Chanda Park land. That's just not a good good idea. But um, so he moved it into the river and there's it's just open. So if you see it in the in the water this year, it's not that he's catching herring in it. 
there's no nets out there, you'll notice he's, he's got the sticks in the river, but there's no nets. So any fish would just pass through it. Um, just in case anyone asks about that, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows um, he's, he's following the rules and um, that's what the state said was okay. It's okay to put that cage thing in the water as long as the fish can swim through. So just a little like, short little story. Chris and I were meeting at uh, <laughs> Canada Park today and a guy was pulled down in a Subaru and was looking at it and he goes, what's that thing out in the river? And we described it as best we could and um, he's like, boy, I've seen everything now. He was he totally, <laughs> we thought that was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, uh, I mean, I think New Hampshire was the last state who hadn't close their herring fishery um so uh it's it's not the numbers aren't good when i talk to fish and game they they said they they are concerned so uh the the um i was there the other day and i saw them there there are herring in there now so let's hope they uh it's actually good because uh when there's not a lot of water coming over the dam they have an easier time getting up our fish, fish ladder. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the problems with the fish ladders. When there's a lot of water coming over the dam, they get pushed out. They can't, they can't get up the ladder. So we're actually in a good place right now for them to run up the river and they can get all the way up to Wadley Falls um, before they reach a dam that they cannot get past. So it, it is amazing what's, what, when you see a good run, it is pretty cool to go down there and see the fish because um, because they're just splashing all around and you think what's that in the water and it's it's all these fish migrating upstream so let's hope it's good um tree presentation with uh kevin martin i am pleased to announce that that will be coming up um let me just and now read from the announcement. Um, Big Trees of New Hampshire with author Kevin Martin is scheduled for Wednesday, uh, June 2nd at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. This is being sponsored by the Conservation Commission and Public Library. Uh, if you go on the New Market Public Library site, there is a place where you can register by um, for the Zoom link. So all you have to do is uh, email newmarketlibrarystaff at gmail.com. And this address, web address is on their site. Um, Kevin Martin is a wooden boat builder, outdoorsman. He'll be discussing his book, Big Trees of New Hampshire. Um, and he will specifically call out local trees in New Market. So, if you want to know about big trees located in Newmarket, uh, Kevin will be talking about them. So I'm very excited about that, and uh, I hope everyone signs up for that. Um, our scholarship uh, application letter has been sent to the guidance department, was sent um, this spring. So we're waiting to get responses. I need uh, three volunteers from the Conservation Commission um, who would be willing to um, review those letters and uh, make a decision on who to award the scholarship to uh, if we are uh, more than one applicant. Um, if we get one applicant, we just have to decide on that one person, but uh, typically we have sort of subcommitted that out um, to a few people. So do I have any volunteers who would be willing to read the letters and then, uh, you know, make a decision on who to award the scholarship to? I'll volunteer. So Chris, Melissa, anyone else? Melissa Sharples. Or Melissa Sharples, okay. So the letters are to come to Town Hall, uh, care of the Conservation Commission. So I'm gonna make an effort to get down there um, but um, if any of you guys, Melissa, if you also have a chance to get down there, Melissa Sharples, I'm okay with you going there and checking if there's any letters um, from any applicants, if you have a chance to go down, because uh, typically we probably award it before our next 
meeting in June, and we would then have someone go. I don't know there will be a ceremony this year that we'd be able to go to. Typically, they have an awards night where we would present the scholarship to that at the awards night, but I'm thinking that might be, if they have it, it might be very limited as to who can attend. Um, it might be only open to friends and graduates or something like that, but I'll, I'll find out and I'll let you guys know. So keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll get some, some applicants. Thank you guys for doing that. Okay. Signs for Wigan Farm. So I'm going to start by sharing these. So let me get that up here. Let's see here. I just got to find it. Got it. Okay. Let me know if you guys can see that. Yes. So these are the signs that Ellen came up with for replacements for um, Wigan Farm. Um, Ellen, I don't know if you want to review anything as we go through them. Um, um, they... Yeah, Patrick, I actually changed um, some of them. I have a different version if you want me to share that. Ah, that would point. be fine. Let me, let okay, me stop right. sharing. Yep, let me stop sharing. I, changed, I just tweaked them a little bit, but they were a little bit... Um, Okay, go ahead. All right, hold on. Okay. Oh, okay, let me see if I can put it on now. Sorry, Google. Hmm, let me share my screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, I think if you've seen the ones that are out there now, they're, they're on four by four posters of pieces of plywood and then these were the old ones were under a plexiglass um and they were sort of laminated paper and they're totally faded and you can't read most of them so it seems like a good time to replace them so um, i took one of them off and we can uh easily reuse the posts and the plywood is all there and so we can just take off the pla the plexiglass there's a lot of screws but it's easy to take off and then these would be aluminum uh, traditional signs they make now these aluminum signs so they're very um, color resistant and they can be mounted with screws right onto that plywood so we're basically just taking the old ones off and putting these new ones in um, and I just drafted these I tried to so we didn't have to move the posts so I tried to pick topics that were interesting but they would fit with kind of where most of the posts are so we don't really have to move um, we might want to move one post um, and I put the town seal and I had Chris and I, Chris helped a little bit. I we were talking about how to, if there, you put a contact, but that would, it gets complicated if you try to put some kind of contact. So I just said it was, you know, the Wigan Farm is owned and managed by the Town of Newmarket. Um, so anyway, I can just zip through these. I don't know that we need to wordsmith them, but <clears throat> if people want to help or want to look at these in more detail before we actually, uh, if you decide you want to go ahead with it, it's the, um, you know, my, a couple more eyes to look at the actual text um, but yeah, I thought this one about woodcock and the alders along the edge of the field is kind of cool. Um, Eastern red cedar, I, I find it just a really interesting plant and there's a lot of it along the stone wall. So that story is, is kind of cool. Uh, the old field habitat, this would be in where we did the Bronto work uh, this spring. Um, so that's interesting. Beavers and wetlands are always interesting in my opinion. <laughs> um, the swamps and marshes, which is a large part of what the Wigan farm is back behind there. And there are some black gum trees in there, which is cool. Um, you're getting my biases of what I think is important. So feel free to, if you think there's some other topics that would be better, that's totally cool. Um, I'm really into dead trees and fallen logs from a wildlife perspective. So there. Um, the farming history for the post that's up uh, by the edge of the field. Um, of course, the milkweed and monarch for monarchs, we have to talk about that. And then I thought it would be helpful to have one along the trail that talks about um, dogs on leash and taking out dog waste. So those, I think that's nine. There are 10, I think there are 10 posts out there. There's three down by the pond, and I don't think we need three there. So I think we could just take one out, and we might want to move 
one um, more toward the entrance when you go over the bridge and then go around because that's really where you know you can talk about the alder and the woodcock right there or you could talk about the monarchs um, there so and then um, Patrick had asked about creating a couple signs that we would put um, right at the bridge and then up at the gate about foot traffic only no vehicles or bikes and I thought that should just be some sort of different you know more um, alert kind of a sign so just a plain sign like something like this um, and that would also be aluminum that we could mount you could mount one on the gate and the one another one could be on a post right before you go over the bridge I think yeah so that's and I did get a cost a while back from Portsmouth sign which is the place I typically use over in Newington they do a great job um, they would be um, she gave me an estimate of $65 a piece there might be some layout so you know, we might want to buffer that a little bit, but if we did, um, if we did 12, well, let's see, we got nine. Well, I said 12, like, let's just, it's, if we might do 12, that's $780. We might want to buffer that a little bit, have to buy some screws. So if you think this is a good idea and you want to do it, I was thinking maybe up to a thousand dollars in that way it's covered and then we'll, you know, probably won't spend that much, but so that would be my suggestion if you think it's a good idea. Down to one of these. I love it. I think it's a great idea, and I'm happy to edit the signs. Great. And I like the tone of this with the please do this and thank you for doing that. I, I think this one, I think they're all good, but I think this one is a nice tone for us to be setting out there. Well, one, one thing I, I think I should point out is that I think that our town has this parcel listed as okay for dogs off leash but i think traditionally the sign has said that we request dogs be on leash during i think it's like the bobolink mating season or nesting season but i think the town allows by by ordinance um dogs off leash on this parcel just just throw it out there i don't think it's a bad idea to keep dogs on leash but <laughs> i just don't know if it's a if it's a conflict that's all okay we can check on that yeah i know Maybe i've looked can... into i know i've looked into it before because it was a big question as it's, a, it's like listed there's like i don't know five parcels in town listed by tax map and lot um mm -hmm. unless they've been repealed since i've last looked which was probably five years ago so <laughs> yeah it might be interesting to revisit that because you know, particularly with COVID, as Patrick said earlier, you know, so many more people are on trails, and I'm not sure that that's going to change. And I was dealing with this in Durham, that with so many more people on trails and so many more dogs, it's really not appropriate for dogs to be off leash unless there's nobody around. Like, if your dog's under control, there's nobody around, no problem. But you don't, I think you have to cover the base to say, please keep your dog on leash. You know, people can use their own judgment. But I just, um, I've become a little, I have, a, I have dogs, so I've been, become a little bit hard noticed about this because people's dogs run up to other people, they run through the fields, you know, it's, I don't know, this is a, this was conserved with a lot of wildlife, drinking water, money, um, it's not supposed to be, you know, a dog run free kind of a place, so. Oh, well, yeah. so you don't know when a person's going to show up. So you're busy thinking there's nobody here, but in fact, I am here, and you didn't know it because I was coming this way, and you hadn't even seen me yet. Yeah. Oh, I'm not completely disagreeing. No, no, with I you. totally understand. <laughs> I'm just saying well, maybe we should revisit that ordinance and see if that can be changed. Yeah, there's, I, um, geez, there's, a, there's a couple, there, there are town properties that are listed, too, and I, I think there's three or five or something like that. And that's called, it's a dog ordinance? Yeah, that... um, I could probably look it up pretty quick in here right now. I'm trying to look at it right now. Okay, well, we can, you know, we'll fix it up to make it, it sure. We can wait on this one and um, see if we want to change the ordinance. Or... One thing that I find that a lot of people are curious about, myself included, is often the orange jelly within the juniper or the red cedar, you know, like orange oh, jelly-like stuff you see yeah, up in there. That's like su it's such a super interesting thing. <laughs> Like you see it, and it's like so out of ordinary color yeah. besides salamanders, perhaps. And, it, and it's yeah. like, what is that orange stuff? You know, 
I don't know. If I it's... thought of that too because I thought people might like it. Was think it was interesting to know about where their male and female plants and whatnot too. Yeah, we'll see if we can put. Through. There's a lot on that one already, but we'll see if we can juggle. I also have, I don't know if it's of interest to you, Ellen, but, or if you have the documents, um, some of the previous owners of that property provided the CONCOM with um, old photographs mm. and stories, essentially a story, a little history, I believe, if I remember right, of, um, of kind of that property back before it was conserved and when there was still a farm on there, some neat, some neat images. Yeah, I think the Knowles family is the one that sent that letter. Um, I don't know, did they, if, I never, I saw the letter, I mean, there's photos in the letter, but of course they're not very high quality because they're embedded in the letter, but did they send yeah. separate photos? Um, I don't know. I can search through my old okay. emails and see yeah. if I have it digitally. Yeah, that'd be cool um, if there's some nice old photo where you can see that would be great. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd love to get that up on social media too. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look for that. I know we have it. It's it's uh, the paper copy, I believe, uh, is in the. I don't even know if they're still there. <laughs> it was in the file cabinet at the uh, town hall. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop. Are yeah. those cabinets still there? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. cabinets are still there, and they they're we have keys for them. <laughs> you just gotta keep trying which key. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was the challenge. Um, but we do we do have access to them. Sue has the keys, so. Oh, no, you gave them back to Wendy. Wendy has the keys, and they had to drill, they had to drill one out. Okay. So I have the gray container, the giant okay. gray container. Who knows what is at the bottom of that container? Oh, you mean of things to be filed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so hopefully we'll be able to get caught up with that. So it sounds like where we are with this is Melissa's going to help editing you're gonna we're gonna do some fine touches on possible dog regulations out there just clarify maybe what is allowed and what isn't because i think that 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 could answer the question if if that's an area that's set aside as designated for off-leash dogs then we want to respect that but if not i think we could stay with the current recommendation um, yeah, I just I saw think, October I, I, 12th, 2017, Minutes of Conservation Commission, where Jeff is talking about that with um, Quox and a few other people. There was quite a dialogue in minutes of October 12th and 2017, and I don't see anything in between that. I don't find the ordinance, but I did find discussion I, there. I, I, did, I did just pull up the ordinance, actually. Um, dogs are, are permitted off-leash. Um, so it's like it's Section 430, Article it's Chapter 4, Article 2, Section 430, um, and it says they're permitted on leash at these specific spots and then permitted off leash at these specific spots. A bunch are Lita Lane, Pembroke Drive, one, Route 150 River, um, that might be Piscataqua Lizelle, Wadley Falls, Route 152, I'm not sure. Um, the Fisk Parcel on Grant Road, which I believe is... That's, that's, the, that's Wigan Farm. Yeah, it's Wigan Farm. So those three parcels listed for Grapevine Hill, Fisk Parcel, Grant Road. Um, I'm wondering if we could ask for the pricing from the, the Portsmouth people. Say there's X number of signs right now, one more pending. So they, we bundle the best number of signs together to get the best price possible. But I think it could be interesting given we know so much more now or we like to be so much more conscientious about everything from various bird mating seasons to, like Patrick said, more and more people using the conservation properties. We want to promote more and more about the outdoors. It might be interesting, or I'd be interested in having us revisit where our dogs even allowed off leash now, given that things and tones and temperaments are so different than a few years ago. Yeah, I, agree. I don't think dogs off leash are compatible with um, William Farm person. So. Well, I, I I agree because I think there's even in the the board that we have, the large board out there, I, I thought did reference the fact that during, because of the ground birds, we asked that people not have dogs off leash, at least in the springtime. Um, so I, I think it's not uh, unreasonable that we've already sort of introduced that, that we might 
say at this point it's just not compatible to have people with dogs off leash but we might also need to touch base with the town council on that it sounds like if it's a actual ordinance well that's what i mean i think we should pursue um what do you call it revoking an ordinance or modifying an ordinance or erasing an ordinance or i mean we have so darn many ordinances i don't I would be a proponent of just going in and hacking out a bunch of them, but I'm pretty radical about fewer ordinances, maybe. All right. Okay, so uh, that was Melissa Sharples was said that she want you wanted to help, right? Yes. yes. Thank you. So I think I we should just continue on with with the rewriting of or the editing of the signs. We'll look into the dog issue. So we're not really ready to make a motion on appropriating a thousand dollars or up to a thousand dollars or does it make sense to go ahead and do that would that give you a, a head start on this ellen if we did that yeah i think we can um because these are individual signs we're not like making 10 of the exact same sign i don't think it's any cost so we could say we're going to do 12 and she'll give me a then we just do 10 now and the other two later it'll be yeah. totally fine they're pretty low. okay so we could, then we could get going on some of them. Like if Melissa and I agree on six okay. or eight, we can get those going and whoever else wants to look at them. Okay. Well, then I will make a motion that we appropriate up to $1,000 to spend on redoing the signs at Wigan Farm. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Oh, sorry. Thanks. All right. Everybody, okay, unanimous. Let's go on to the treasurer's report. Okay. You, yep. Let me ask. Yep. You're gonna I, share that, Ellen, or do you want me to share that? You can share if you want. I don't have that up on my. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think you got the copy from. Uh, it was forwarded. So the general fund balance, which is the 2000 some we get, the balance is $648.42. The total conservation fund balance is $170,812.58. So the $75,000 for the Clark easement came out from since last meeting, the 170000 um, and no other uh, no other income except for the interest that we get, which is part of that balance. I know the town received the check from Fish and Game for three thousand one hundred fifty dollars, which is the Habitat small grant that we got, but it it didn't get into this month. This April's month, so it'll probably show up on the May balance sheet. And I think that's it. Okay. Great. Um, yes, that's, that's a good point about the Clark easement that that's finally completely closed at this point. So that's why the, the funds have come out. So congratulations to Southeast land trust on helping us get that completed. That is done. So good, good work on that. Um, I think it might be, hopefully we might be able to. I know I've talked to SELT about this, is that hopefully at some point we'll be able to have something where we do some kind of recognition, whether it's at Clark Farm or, you know, invite the Clarks to a meeting or something like that. I would like to see them recognize for what they're doing mm -hmm. because it's a um, piece of property that they're conserving and it's, uh, Great. Okay, uh, Riverfront uh, Committee, the Riverfront Advisory Committee. I always for forget how to title you guys, Sam. Well, I don't know if they have an official title yet. <laughs> I still keep writing it different on every page that I uh, put together myself. Um, uh, let's see, since our last meeting, we met, I believe, April 20th. We were also supposed to meet this Tuesday uh, due to technical issues we did not and we'll be meeting next Tuesday um, I guess in in a nutshell I'm not quite sure what I had mentioned back in April at our last meeting 
but we we are still kind of moving forward with the consideration that the first step in this process will be um, trying to pursue a, a grant through DEF. Um, that grant theoretically will be out this month and due in July. So there's there's some work on the committee's angle uh, to uh, to kind of start laying the groundwork for that. I believe we are going to draft an RFQ, and if we have support from from the town and town council, uh, put that RFQ out to try to get um, architectural or engineering assistance to uh, start kind of developing conceptual plans of riverfront areas, um, Riverwalk, Extension, Shanda Park, uh, like living shoreline or, or resiliency aspect, and um, potentially a pedestrian bridge as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the short term focus is just trying to seek grant funding uh, to kind of kick off starting to make conceptual uh, images of the area that people can start kind of reviewing and, and thinking about and, and offering input on. So that's sort of where we're at uh, right now. And that's sort of the focus for the next month or two. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the update. Oh, can I ask a question? Sure. Is that for a pedestrian bridge across the river? That's the thought. <laughs> the thought. That that was brought to us many times. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a specific individual in town that's quite interested in that. <laughs> yeah, it's a awesome. fantastic idea. But that's mm -hmm. no, I just said it's awesome. I could. Yeah. Could you picture it? Yeah. Yeah, it's quite expensive. I believe we kind of got a couple of prices, maybe kind of like on the side back then about it and it was it was a little pricey but there's so many other options that, that i that i think would be great there we also looked into that we had the town engineer actually come out and give us advice on fixing the retaining walls and everything but um they were underwood engineers that came out and kind of walked with us and kind of looked at it but didn't get anywhere well, instead of buy a brick fundraiser we could have buy a plank so you'd buy a plank to get the bridge built <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had been in Maryland at my aunt's house, and I saw these massive, long boardwalks on the on the water, and with like just raised portions that small fishing boats were going under, and everything like that. And it's like literally just like almost like a like a pier kind of, you know. Basically, it wasn't some elaborate crazy bridge. It's literally just like <laughs> a dock essentially with handrails, <laughs> you know. And it, it it didn't seem like that was going to cost a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it's two docks that just meet in the middle. That's all. Exactly. <laughs> Need a dock permit from the state. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I they said that the state of New Hampshire is going to get one point five billion dollars that they have to figure out how to spend. So, the town can get some portion of that. <laughs> um. Well, thanks, Sam. I I appreciate. Yeah, the, Jeff. Just to kind of update you, that's the point of 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 uh, what Sam's committee is working on. So they've got a variety of people to try and move move that forward. To Excellent. we know Shanda Park is in need of revitalization, but also just incorporating it into a broader plan for the riverfront because we do have ideas about creating more trails and things like that down there. So yeah, excellent. I think it's a fantastic idea to have pedestrian access directly to Heron Point in town. Yeah. Okay. Am I, I don't think I've missed anything, but I will always ask, is there any other items that anyone else wanted to bring up? I have two. Okay. Just real quick, I wanted to remind, or just to let people know that our June meeting guest will be talking about, name is to be determined, but the topic is um, night time pollinators and what we can do as homeowners to help the moths. Butterflies have great PR guys and the moths need some more PR about what they're doing to, to help pollinate plants. So um, the topic will be nighttime and what you can do as a homeowner to minimize light and um, touch a little bit on some of those efforts and some of the, I always try and say it in a positive way, but there's deleterious effects that nighttime light has on bats, for instance, being able to go out and forage for all the mosquitoes they eat. And there's also some effects on, on 
purpose, let alone migration. So anyway, our topic for June is nighttime landscape lighting or home lighting. And I also wanted to bring up, I, I think this is okay to bring up now, um, if we could circle around back to Matt Tarr. He had been a guest in the winter. I want to say he was a guest in February. But he had offered, and we had all nodded excitedly that he would come back sometime in the summer and, and lead a walkabout um, on, the, on a property. And I think it would be great if we could pick a date in June or if we could decide if we really want to have that happen, he could come back and be, be a, a feature. We could have a, a mini event. The UNH is allowed now to have to deploy their people and they can be in small groups. So I would be interested to see if we're interested in getting back to Matt Tarr to, to lead a group and have a talk about the, a property. Um, but I think June would be a great month to do it. Um, yeah, I think we can farm, um, because he can talk about field management, we might want to give him right. some ideas about that. A Wigan Farm would be a good spot. Yeah, and it focuses our interest on Wigan Farm. Since we just had the grant, we've just had the Bronto work, we're getting these signs that could be really interesting to focus on, on Wigan. Not to mention parking there is so darn easy to get a group together to go on a walk there. So the logistics for Wigan, I think, really kind of shout. Yeah, that would be fine, Chris. Positive. If you want to throw, um, or are you going to reach out to Matt and ask him what dates would be good for him in June, or do you want? I to think between him? Ellen and I, we can get Matt. She knows him very well as well. Um, I have a working relationship with him and she has worked with him for a long time. So between the two of us, we should probably find out what dates he can do since his schedule might be determined in a minimal way with uh, summer programs or monitoring grad students. So um, probably, Ellen, do you think you could get a hold of him and see what he suggests for dates and then we could do it? Could we do it by email maybe and book him a date? Or does anybody here have a time they know they can't do? Well, I don't know if this is something that Matt would be willing to do, but one thing that's nice about June is that because those are some of the longest days of the year, if we could do it on a weekday in the afternoon, evening, that would be, that would be nice. Um, it sure would. I don't, I just don't know if that's reasonable to ask of him to do it on a weekend. Um, well, no is always an acceptable answer. So yeah. I would think a, a late afternoon would be a really great time or an evening would be a really great time. It'll be out in the evening and it's a benefit yeah. of our northern latitudes. Yeah, yeah. So. I think he'd prefer that over a weekend. So I bet that would work out well. Okay, good, good. Well, see what he says. All right. Well, thanks, Chris, for There's no back. time here that we would not want to do it, though, right? Um, I know. I, I, I won't. I won't. Do only, it. only on the date that Kevin's speaking, right? We don't want to. We don't want to conflict with All that. All right. So take out June second. Yeah. Take out June second. <laughs> take out our own regular meeting. <laughs> yep. So some sometime maybe the third week of July or June. So right close to summer. So Melissa can... Sharples was about to say a date or something. I'm sorry, Melissa. What were you about to say? I'll shout that I I would not be available on the 10th and 11th. So I would hope that maybe the week after. Same for me. So that sounds okay. Okay. But then can we once we get that date, or we can we do it? by running it by you and we could just go ahead and book him for a certain date? Yeah, I think we can just go ahead and book it. I mean, I don't, okay. I don't think, I don't think that's, we're not, we're not expending anything. He's not going to charge us to do this. He'll, he'll do it for gratis, right? As part of his UNH work. So, right. um, I think we need to, I think the biggest thing would just promote it and Melissa can do that through Facebook. So, um, you know, put it in the town newsletter if we have time yeah okay nice so just not the 10th or not the 11th or 12th or 10th or 11th right 10th and 11th so 10 and 11 okay awesome thank you i think it's great to fully circle around since he offered after having been a guest okay so before we uh adjourn i want to take one special moment to do 
a, a deep recognition and a big thanks to Melissa Brogel for her work on the roadside cleanup in April. Uh, I can't tell you how many people participated. This was a tremendous success and just great to see. I mean, all this, I don't know how many, I was, someone was asking us to quantify how much garbage was removed. And I, I really don't know. I couldn't begin to tell you because it seemed like a lot though, <laughs> more than 50 bags. <laughs> Thank you. It, it was fun. I had a lot of fun organizing that. <laughs> it was great. I, I, I think that um, really well, and I just was so excited about it. Um, and yeah, we picked up a lot of garbage. So. We did. And the, the streets that, that I've noticed in the past that tend to be very dirty are still fairly clean. So mm -hmm. that's yep. always nice to see. <laughs> Uh, Bill from Iron Goat, um, they posted on their Facebook page, and he revealed the truck full of big, heavy things and kept thanking you throughout the entire thing. I was trying to figure yes. out, can you grab that and put it on our own? <laughs> I think I did share it. Um, I think I did right, right when he posted it, because he texted me and told me that he was um, posting it, but they were awesome. He He... I mean, he stepped up, I think, the first time I made a post on social media, um, and that worked out really well. So I'm hoping we can do that again in future years. And I'm still working on updating the map. Um, not everybody who signed up shared pictures or stats. You know, some people just don't like to do that. You know, they just want to sign up and go clean up trash and go home, um, which is still really awesome. Um, but I have some um, street names from Tony from her cleanup. Um, so I want to add those to the map, maybe in a different color and, you know, add the pictures that and, um, get that back out there. I've just April tends to be a very busy month for me at work. So it's, it was a little, um, April and beginning of May. So I haven't done that yet, but I want to do that soon. Right. Well, that's a good place to adjourn. So, uh, I'll make a motion that we adjourn at eight 53. Do I have a second? Second. Chris, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good night. Good night. Nice to see you, Jeff. Nice to see you all as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.